Phase 2.3, how to think like a rich person. In this phase, you are going to learn how you too can be rich, just like Warren Buffett, Donald Trump, and Bill Gates by learning the ways that made them rich. They do not have different rules than us. They just know how to use the rules to their advantage. She slowly walked into the living room as she was holding a piece of paper in her hand. My new bride of six months was noticeably irritated about something. My mind raced to think of what it could be. Being the numbers person of the family, she had been going over our finances. We didn't have much money, even with my job. My roommates moved out, so there went their rent, and now I had to support my wife. Questions ran through my mind like, did I forget to pay a bill? And did we not have enough money to pay the mortgage? Being that she moved from Arizona to live with me in California, she hadn't found a job until recently. I can't believe it, she exclaimed. What? What happened? Everything okay? I asked. Yes, everything is fine, but can you believe the California government? She asked. Um, what's up? I asked. I can't believe how horrible taxes are here in California. I just received my first paycheck for my new job here in California, and the taxes are so ridiculous, she said. Well, there are taxes in Arizona, so what's the difference? I asked. In Arizona, I made more money per hour. Actually, like $9 more per hour than I make here in California. You would think that the total dollar amount of taxes would be less here in California, right? She asked. Sure, you made more total money from your job in Arizona than you are in California. What's the problem? I asked. Even though my check in California is $400 less than I was making in Arizona, there is more money taken out in taxes in California. Not just a little, but a lot more total dollars were taken out for my California paycheck where I made $400 less than Arizona, she exclaimed. Needless to say, this is just one of the reasons we moved out of California 11 years later. But the main point is that even though you work hard at your J-O-B, you are penalized by the government for working a J-O-B. You are penalized in the form of taxes in your J-O-B, and it shows up in your paycheck. Now, all states and cities have different tax rates, but the one thing that is consistent, if you work a J-O-B, you are taxed more than investors like Warren Buffett, Donald Trump, and myself. This is because we don't work for money. We have our money work for us. Instead of having a J-O-B, we pay others to work and buy investments that make us money. In both cases, we are taxed differently than an hourly waged employee. No more trading hours for dollars. Most employees feel they are worth more than they are being paid, which leads to a sense of entitlement. Remember, J-O-B equals just over broke. If you have only one job, usually you are only able to work 40 hours a week for one employer, and your hourly wage is typically fixed unless you are on a commission. Let's look at some of the problems with trying to become rich as an employee. 1. As an employee, you trade your hours for the employer's dollars, so you are stuck with whatever the employer decides to pay you. If you will not work for the pay, the employer will find someone else to do the job and pay them instead. 2. Everyone has limited time to give to a job. Attempting to work five jobs 40 hours a week at each one is physically impossible. There are not enough hours in the week to give, and you would not have the ability to perform as your boss expects. 3. Employees are a commodity for business owners. Just like any other commodity, it is supply and demand. If you work for Google, your job skills for the position are such that very few people can do what you can do. Your wage will probably be much higher than the normal wage because there are less people who can do your job. If you work for McDonald's, you will probably be making the minimum wage because there are many others who can do the same work as you. 4. The IRS takes around 35% of your wages from you before you can even cash your check. Then, if you consider state and sales tax, the total taxes you could be paying as an employee can be up to 50% of your wages. Just like that, half your money is gone. 5. The biggest problem of them all is once you stop working, you stop being paid. If you were laid off or fired from your job, how would you pay for your expenses? Practical steps to achieving the goal of quitting your J-O-B. Start with the end in view. Dream big and create your five-year goals and work backwards from there. Start with creating your five-year goals. Where do you want to be? How many rental properties do you want to own? Do you want to quit your job? 
How much money do you want to have saved for when you quit your job? Make a list of all these five-year goals. Create one-year milestones from your five-year goals. If you want to own 15 rental properties in five years, how would you go about doing that? You wouldn't be able to buy eight the first year, right? How about starting small, and as you build year after year, your momentum gains and you can do more in year five than you did in year one? See the blog posts on how to retire in five years. Year one, buy one rental property. Year two, buy two rental properties. Year three, buy three rental properties. Year four, buy four rental properties. Year five, buy five rental properties. Each goal should have yearly milestones and monthly, weekly, and daily action steps for each goal. With a general five-year goal, life gets in the way, and by the time you realize it, you are in the second year without any action taken on your five-year plan. Now, you only have four years to do what you originally had five years to accomplish. Work on your goals daily so you can successfully reach them in the time frame you set for yourself. Create short-range goals from your year one milestones. These should be specific action steps you can take to accomplish these one-year goals. If your desire is to save up $30,000 in five years, you can do it by either cutting expenses or increasing revenue. You may cut expenses and save $6,000 per year from your salary, or start a small service business being a handyman to increase your annual income by $6,000 and save that amount. Each yearly goal should hopefully build on itself. After time, your small service business may not be so small because of advertising, word of mouth, etc. It may be bringing in much more money, which would allow you to save the $30,000 faster and buy more properties faster, all while beating your deadline by a couple years. Read or rewrite your goals every day. If you can't remember your goals, how well do you think you will accomplish them? Keep your goals on the forefront of your mind so you know exactly where you are in the process, what you need to do next, where you are deficient, and how to proceed. Spend at least 30 minutes each day working on your goals. Do anything that will help you reach your goals daily. If you wait all week to take the action steps on Friday, what should have been done on Tuesday, you are almost setting yourself up for failure. Get the most important things done at the start of the day, week month, and year, so you are not up against the deadline as time runs away from you. Do your best to not move your deadline. I'm sorry to do this to you, but imagine this scenario. You are back in your senior year of high school, and the final paper or report assignment is due tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. You had all semester to research, draft, write, proofread, and finalize the report, but you put it off until the day before, and now it is crunch time. Get it done, or fail the class. Isn't it interesting that when our backs are up against the wall, we are capable of doing wonderful things in almost unrealistic timelines. Remember, you set these goals you gave for yourself, and you also set the deadlines for when these goals are to be accomplished. When you move a deadline that you create for yourself, a couple of things happen. You remove your ability to hunker down and get things done as you did when you were in high school with the report deadline. You give yourself permission to fail. You set yourself up to move the deadline again and again and again. Traditional education is teaching you how to be an employee. When we are young, we are all told to go to school and get good grades. Then we are to go to college and get a degree. Once completed, we are told to go find a job and get a pension, IRA, 401k, and we will be able to stop working when we are 65 years old. Being an employee is a very honorable career, and for the majority of society, this is a perfect fit for them. The government schools do not teach us how to be rich, but rather how to take orders and be an employee. We are taught to carry out the orders with a defined answer from the teacher's questions. To have financial freedom, we need to educate ourselves and learn from those who are already rich. Those who want to be rich need to educate themselves to think like the rich because the rules of life are not different for them. Some say that the rich in America have different rules than the middle or lower classes, but this is not the case. In America, as there is equal justice under the law, there is also equal opportunity to be rich. The only way to be rich is to learn how to use the rules to play the game as the rich do. 
They have the same rules, but they know how to use those rules to their advantage. It has been stated that Warren Buffett, the billionaire investor, pays less in taxes than his secretary. He actually pays a lower tax rate than his secretary, which is different than total tax dollars. In 2012, Warren Buffett paid a capital gains tax rate of 17.4%, and his secretary paid an income tax rate of 35.8%. They both live under the same tax laws, but Warren chooses to make his money in a way that is taxed half as much as his secretary. His secretary is using everything she learned in school to be the best secretary for her boss, but the government still takes twice as much out of her paycheck than Warren Buffett. This is because his income is earned as passive income. Passive income is taxed as capital gains, which is a lower tax rate, 17.4%, than earned income, 35.8%. Following the example of the rich, you can use the laws to your benefit as they do. One, pay less in taxes and keep more of your money to spend however you want. Two, invest passive streams of income with cash flow every month. Three, Quit working and stop paying the outrageous income tax rates. Four, stop trading hours for dollars. Five, your money works for you while you enjoy its fruits. Six, financial independence. Seven, you can leave a legacy to your loved ones. Eight, the ability to give more and more to those who are in need. The reason why it seems as though the rich have it easier than you is because they have learned how to play the game and use the laws to help them get rich. To be successful, you need to be educated like the rich. In Robert Kiyosaki's book, Cash Flow Quadrant, he teaches the four ways people make money, employee, sole proprietor, business owner, and investor. See graph 2.3a. E's and S's, left side of the cash flow quadrant. Employee. The employee desires job security, a steady paycheck, no financial risk, and the benefits provided by their jobs, retirement, insurance, time off, sick days, etc. Sense of entitlement is high with employees, and they trade hours for dollars. They also pay the highest tax rate. Sole proprietor. Sole proprietors are their own boss and are not dependent upon other people for their financial security. These include doctors, lawyers, and anyone who is self-employed. They desire independence and tend to be controlling, not trusting others to do the work as good as they can. Their income is tied directly to how much they work, and if they do not work, they don't get paid. They basically own a job. B's and I's, right side of the cash flow quadrant. Business owner. Business owners start businesses and hire employees to delegate as much as possible. They work on the business and find competent people to work in the business. They desire to create a business that can run on its own without them. They focus on creating systems for the business to make money without them. Investor. Investors look for ways to make their money as well as the money of others work for them. They desire to work less so they can spend their time however they want while not being tied down to a job. Escapes high taxes by deferring their taxes to a future date or utilizes the IRS rules to pay the lower tax rate of all the other groups. They receive 70% of their income from investments and less than 30% from a job. If you want to be rich, you should move to the B and I side of the cash flow quadrant ASAP. The rich focus the majority of their efforts on the business and investor side of the cash flow quadrant because that is where the real wealth and money is. The good news is, if you are starting in the employee category, you can move to any of the other quadrants at any given time. It is entirely possible to move from E to I very quickly. Here are some of the benefits of being on the right side of the cash flow quadrant. One. Every dollar you invest is another employee working for you who makes more employees who do the same. 2. Live wherever you want. 3. Do whatever you want. 4. Buy whatever you want. 5. Income comes in the mail whether you work 60 hours a week or 1. 6. Complete financial freedom. 7. Pay lowest of all tax rates. 8. 
defer taxes to a future date with IRS 1031 exchanges almost indefinitely. 9. No liability because corporations own everything. 10. Complete control over everything because they own the corporations. 11. Not dependent on anyone for their lifestyle or freedom. 12. As soon as their income from investments surpass their wages, they retire. 13. Not dependent on Social Security, 401k, IRA, pension, etc. Taking Action for Phase 2.3 Commit to changing your way of thinking from an employee who trades dollars for hours to an investor who gets paid by the value that you can produce. Get started now. If you have not done it yet, take 15 to 20 minutes to consider and write down your five-year goals. Really think through them and get them on paper. Take 15 minutes to figure out your yearly milestones. Plan how you will get out of the left side of the cash flow quadrant to the right side. Phase 3. Building a Strong Structure Phase 3.1. Make your money work for you, not you for your money. If you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. Warren Buffett Hey babe, we just made an extra $350 this month, I shouted to my wife with excitement. How did we do that? She asked. The rental property we bought is now rented, and we are making money, I explained. Oh, terrific. I'm so relieved that this rental property business seems to be actually working out, she said. Yes, and this is just the start of the business with one property. Imagine if we had five properties that brought in $350 a month. That would be $1,750 a month in passive income, I exclaimed. That would be such a huge blessing, wouldn't it? She asked. It sure would be. What if we had 10, 20, or even 30 properties making that much? I wouldn't even need to work a job anymore, I said. We'll have to keep growing the business, but just make sure we don't grow too fast. This passive income thing is amazing, but I don't want us to get in over our heads, she said. Well, 10 years and 35 properties, we're doing very well. Since I will never stop buying properties, the income will only go up. The money we invest in a rental property is basically like a little employee working for us. Now, we have millions of little employees working for us, making us money every minute of every day. Even when we sleep, we are still making money. Have your dollars be like employees working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Passive income in monthly cash flow through real estate is truly passive. You are not working for a job where you clock in or out, but you are working on your business. With real estate property, managers are my best friends. I hire the best property manager because I want the best manager looking after my properties, making me the most money while I sit back and get my monthly statement in the mail with a fat rent check. My property manager does all the work, gets compensated well, and I just make money. By owning just one single family home with tenants who pay you monthly rent to live there, you are bringing in $300 to $400 a month in passive income. You buy the home once, and your house is working for you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Whether you are in Hawaii or camping in the mountains, your property is working hard at making you money every minute of every day. Now imagine you had 10 properties that brought in the same amount of money each month, minus expenses. This would bring you $3,000 to $4,000 a month in passive income. Here's the general math for one property with easy round numbers. See chart 3.1a. Rental home on 321 Main Street. Purchase price $100,000. Monthly expenses. Mortgage $536. 5% note at 30 years. Taxes and insurance $175. Total monthly expenses $711. Monthly income. Rents collected $1,100. Net operating income NOI. $1,100 minus $175 equals $925. Total profit, income minus expenses, $389. This home on 321 Main Street would bring you $389 a month in cash flow from passive income. Now, imagine you owned 10 of these properties bringing in $389 a month in passive cash flow. This equates to $3,339 in your pocket every month, 
without you doing any work since your money is doing the work. Now, imagine how your life would be if you owned 100 of these properties. Your income would be $33,390 a month in passive cash flow. The plan, how to quit your J-O-B in five years. If you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Benjamin Franklin. In order to understand what it would take for you to retire from your job, you need to know what your expenses are. By knowing your expenses, you will have a target income needed to live off of. If you have not completed the budget from the form earlier, do so now. Find the total expenses that you have and that will give you the total dollar amount that you need in order to quit your job. The total I needed was $4,000 a month from passive income for my family and me to live securely and not need my job. Once I found my number, I was able to plan out my future investing career. Now, let's work on how you can do the same thing too. Step 1. Find your target income amount. From the budget you created in the last chapter, write down your total monthly expenses. This is your benchmark dollar amount you must get to in order to not need your J-O-B to pay your bills. Once you acquire enough rental properties to pay for these expenses, you really don't need a job. Let's say that you have $3,800 in expenses every month, and you want to quit your job and have enough income to pay your mortgage, bills, travel expenses, etc. Step 2. Determine how you will invest. Now, think of what it would take to attain $4,000 in monthly passive income in monthly cash flow. It could be that in the next five years, you buy a total of 15 properties that make you $300 a month in passive income in monthly cash flow. There are many different types of properties that will bring you this kind of return on your money. A good rule of thumb is to stick with properties that people in the market you are investing in would want to rent. I personally stay away from two-bedroom homes. They are harder to rent. The prices are almost as high, and the rents are much less. I suggest sticking with a cookie-cutter type of home. See chart 3.1b. With these two types of properties, you will have a good chance of getting a good return on your money. With interest rates being at or around 3%, the expenses and the mortgage payment would be much less than the rent, and you would get passive income in cash flow each month. Step 3. Know how many properties you need to pay for all your expenses. To retire in five years with your expenses at $4,000, your yearly plan could look like this. Year one, buy one single family home with $300 monthly income. Year two, buy two single family homes with $300 monthly income. Year three, buy three single family homes with $300 monthly income. Year four, Buy four single-family homes with $300 monthly income. Year five, buy five single-family homes with $300 monthly income. At year five, you have 15 single-family homes with $300 a month coming in. That would be $4,500 a month in passive cash flow. Imagine what you could do with $4,500 a month. You could pay your expenses and have extra money to spend on whatever you want. If you continue on that path of adding more properties to your investment portfolio, you double, triple, or even make 10 times that each month. Now, you may be thinking that buying properties in that example is impossible. Believe me, it's not. I have done it, and so can you. In six years, I have bought 19 single-family homes that bring in $400 or more a month in passive income. Plus, I did all this while having a full-time job and a full-time family. Everyone's circumstances are different. Where they start, how they build their business, and how they end. All of my students that I coach how to invest in real estate have different situations and circumstances that we work through to help them attain their goal. A big part of my coaching is figuring out a plan to help them get to their goal with where they are currently. Lots of debt, low or no income, lack of investing knowledge, no finances, no savings, etc. are all things that my students have all overcome in order to change their lives. Wherever your financial situation is, there is a way out. It will take work, but if you push through it, you can build a successful real estate business. If you learn how to invest in rental properties, you will have the passive income you need to reach your goals. Right now, buying 15 properties in five years sounds pretty daunting, but you can do it. There are so many different ways to purchase rental properties that you will have no issue with finding them. If you learn some of the advanced techniques, you can even buy them with no money out of your pocket. 
In the next chapters, you will learn all the steps needed to earn passive income from rental properties and quit your job. Taking action for phase 3.1. Go to www.zillow.com and look at the surrounding areas of your city for other places to invest. Look for properties that match the criteria we already discussed. Three bedroom, two bathroom, 1,400 square feet. Start an Excel worksheet and keep track of all the properties that catch your eye and seem to meet your criteria. Keep this sheet as a record of the following characteristics of the properties. Address, asking price, bedrooms, bathrooms, rental estimate. Phase 3.2, principles to invest anywhere in the world. Recently, I got an email question from one of my podcast listeners. Actually, this is the same as many others who listen to my podcast, read my investing articles, and from those who read my books. Hey, Dustin, I came across your podcast this past month, and it has opened my eyes and inspired me to take a similar path in life to you. It seems we have a lot of similarities in how we want to spend our time and how valuable family time is. I've owned a barbershop in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada for the past three years and have always been interested in rental properties to create passive income. I live in Canada and hope that your methods work similar in this country. I'm very thankful for all your advice, Dustin. Because I live in America, people tend to think that investing in real estate doesn't work outside the USA. This is not true at all. Real estate investing can be done anywhere in the world. There are only two caveats to this. One, places where you cannot own property. Two, places where you do not want to live. The former would be very bad places where thieves, military dictators, socialist governments, and others can and will just take your property from you. The beauty about America and most of the Western world is the freedom to own property without concern that someone will take it by force. The latter would be places like in the Middle East or the desert or in the middle of a swamp. Places like this have a very limited amount of people that would actually want to rent from you. Also, you would have a hard time getting financing for these properties as well. Banks are very hesitant to lend in places that people do not want to live. Investing in real estate rental properties is basically the same throughout the entire world. It doesn't matter the country as long as you follow these principles. Always make a positive monthly return of cash flow each month. At the top of the list, and I mean the number one reason for investing in real estate, is making a positive cash flow each month from the rents received. The equation for this is super simple. Actually, I'm teaching this to my seven-year-old and he gets it. Example. A three-bedroom, two-bathroom home has monthly rents for $1,200 and has $850 in total monthly expenses. Income minus expenses equals profit. $1,200 minus $850 equals $350. Cash flow means money coming in or out of your pocket. Positive cash flow puts money in your pocket and negative cash flow takes money out. From the equation above, if you own this property, you would make a positive cash flow of $350. That is $350 more a month coming into your pocket. Monthly cash flow is the reason why rental property owners make money no matter what happens in the real estate market. The market can go up, down, or sideways, and the rental property will still make money each month. Even if the market crashes and the property value drops in half, my properties still make me money. The reason why I will always make money in every market is there will always be renters since everyone needs a place to live and I'm happy to give them the ability to rent a nice home where I make money every month. Buy lower than market value. There is a phrase I want you to learn. You make your money when you buy the property. You realize your money when you sell the property. As in the stock market, if you buy low and sell high, you make money. Imagine buying Amazon stock at $250 a share when they first went public. Over time, as the company does well and grows, the value of that stock goes up. Now imagine selling the Amazon stock for $750. You just made a profit of $500. This is the sale price, less the purchase price, and this gives you your profit. $750 minus $250 equals $500 in profit. The same goes for real estate. As an investor, you want to buy low and sell high, but I'll do one even better. Imagine buying Amazon stock at a discount price. Instead of $250, you pay $200. 
$175 or $100 for the same stock. That stock would be heavily discounted even though you know the value of the stock is actually $250. This is exactly what you can do with real estate. In real estate, it is absolutely possible to buy a property for lower than the actual value of the property. In fact, every property I purchase is worth much more than I bought it for. When you do this, you capture equity on the first day you buy the property. One property I purchased in Houston was worth $225,000 at the time. I bought it for $151,000. The property needed work and I put in $22,000 to get it rented. That is $173 total to get the property. $225,000 minus $173,000 equals $52,000 profit. That is a $52,000 profit on the property captured in equity in the property. If I were to sell it, that is how much I would be able to sell it for and the profit not including fees. As investors though, we don't flip homes. We rent for cash flow. At some point in the future, I will sell this home to trade it up and buy apartment complexes. Buy properties you can fix up and force up appreciation. When I buy properties, I buy them so that I can make money by fixing up the property to make it nicer for someone to live in. I never buy the best house on the street. I buy the best investment on the street that I can add value to by fixing it up. You want to buy properties that you can invest your money into to fix up. After it is fixed up, you will have an increase in property value because of the new updates. Make sure the expenses are lower than the rental income. Income must be more than your expenses in order to make money every month from the rents. Pro tip, always go back and analyze your expenses to see if you can lower them. At least once a year, go over all your expenses and make sure you have cut as many of the costs out of your expenses. Here are some ideas of where you can look out for expenses to cut. Insurance. Lower property taxes. Find a new property manager. Electric company. Etc. Increase your rental income. Once a year, you should look at all of the properties for a potential rental price increase. Most homes are on a yearly lease. A lease is good for both the landlord and the renter. It is good for the landlord because it locks the tenant in for one year. It is also good for the tenant because it locks them in the property for one year and keeps the price of rent the same for the one year. Once the lease is up, look to increase the rent 5% to 10%. I personally would not go any more than that. The only reason why I would would be to get the tenant out of the report sooner than they may want to leave. If you need to raise the rents up 30% to catch up to market rents, it would be a good idea to do so slowly over time. 5% here, 10% there, and over time, you will be up to market rents. Pro tip, if you are raising rents, let the tenant know that the market rents are 30% more than they are paying. Because you are understanding and want to take care of them, you are only going to raise it up 7.5% every year until you get to the market rents. This gives you your increase and allows the tenant to adjust for the rent increase or move out. Make sure there is enough demand for your property. When you are looking for a place to invest, take your time to make sure to inspect all aspects of the area. Inspect the city, community, neighborhood, and street to ensure there is demand for your properties. Again, if you buy in the middle of the desert, there may not be many people that would want to rent your place. Only invest where people will rent your property. If the demand is low for your rental, you will get low rents for it because of high supply and low demand. You want to get top dollar for your property. If you are renting in an area that has problems with it, you will run into issues. Things to look out for. Crime, poor schools, industrial commercial sites, etc. These are not the best places for people to live, so people won't want to rent there. Pro tip. Look at the movement of crime throughout the area. Crime moves location, so see the trend and the path it is going. Make sure you are not in the path of future crime. One area of the country I invested in 10 years ago was a good area. The crime was in the southwest area of the city, and I was investing in the far southeast area. It was a good area 10 years ago, but over time, the crime moved from the west to the east. Now that area is a rough area. Harder to find good tenants in rougher areas. Buy good investments, not good properties. A good investment will make you monthly cash flow from the rents. 
A good property is the nicest on the block, needs no work, is worth more than the others in the area. This is not what you want. You want a property you can pay lower than market value for, fix up, and increase the value. A good investment will make you money. A good property may cost you more money and your income will be lower. A good property is one that you want to live in, not rent out to a tenant. Remember, each property is another piece of inventory in your business. Think of them as inventory and not a home you will be living in. Place good tenants and run background checks. When I first started, I never did a background check. Man, was I wrong. I lost so much money because I didn't really know the history of the tenant I was placing in my property. Your goal is to keep a tenant in your property for as long as possible. The longer they are in there, the more money you make. Once I got smart and started doing background checks, I found my income stabilized, fewer evictions occurred, and I was making a lot more money. Good tenants are out there. You just need to wait until one comes to you to live in your property. After I started doing background checks, I found a potential tenant was evicted four times in three years. Her application looked great. Good rental history, good income, good everything. But she was lying. Needless to say, I did not allow her to rent my property. Make the property rent ready, not the best house on the street. If you make the property the best property, you may have spent too much money fixing it up. When the other properties in your area do not have granite countertops, you may not need to spend that money to get a good tenant. You may even be adding in extra costs to your fix-up that you did not need. You want your investment to bring as much money as possible into your pockets with the least amount of money out of it. As you are going through the process of fixing up the property, make sure you keep asking the question, will what I'm doing to the property make me more money in the end? If the answer is no, then consider leaving it out. Buy properties that make you $250 or more each month in passive income. There's a great reason why you want to make $250 or more. It is because you want to make as much money as possible, right? Of course you do. Well, if you didn't account for possible unexpected expenses, you may run a negative. If you don't make $250 a month in passive income, one large issue will cost you your entire year's worth of profit. If a furnace would go out, you may need to replace it. That cost alone could be $3,000 to $5,000. With only making $100 a month in profit, you would only make $1,200 a year. It would take you at least two years at $100 a month in profit to pay for the new furnace. If you made $250 a month, you would make $3,000 in one year, which would be much easier to help pay for the new furnace. Make sure you make enough money each month to turn a profit every year. Run your business like a business. As soon as you own one rental property, you now own a business. Even if it is a small one, it is still a business. On top of getting all the tax benefits of having a business, you get the benefit of acting like a business. This may sound like common sense, but you would be surprised how many people do not treat their business like a business. I, like every other investor out there who started on their own, made the mistake of the same thing, not running the business as a business. Let me give you an example. What would happen if you stopped paying your mortgage to the bank for the home you live in? Would they be a pushover and allow you to get by without making half the payments, missing deadlines, and allowing you to live in the property without starting the foreclosure process? Absolutely not. The second you missed a payment or made a half payment, they would start the process of foreclosure as documented in the note you signed when you got your mortgage. The bank is running like a business when they follow the rules. These rules were put in place when they gave you the loan and you got the keys to your new house. Once the transaction is finished, it now depends on business decisions from this point out. If a bank running like a business would not let you stay in the property one second longer than you paid for, then why would you allow a tenant to stay in the property for a second longer than they have paid for? The answer is, you shouldn't. Running your business like a business is where you set up and follow the business rules you put in place. Let me give you an example of rules to follow. One. Rent is due on the first. Two, rent is late after the third with a late fee. Three, on the third, a three-day notice to pay or vacate is put on the door. Four, three days later, the eviction is filed with a local court. Five, the eviction process, once started, will not stop until it is finished or the tenant pays for all the back rent, late fees, court fees, lawyer fees, 
along with any and all other fees. 6. Do not accept any money unless it is in full. Any money received will cause the eviction process to stop. 7. File a writ with the court and meet the sheriff deputy at the property to remove the tenant and their belongings. This is what I mean by running your business as a business. Set up business rules and processes in your business and follow them. Don't be lenient unless you absolutely must. When you are lenient, the tenant will consider you a lenient landlord and will continue to push the limits of your leniency. I've personally lost tens of thousands of dollars by not following these and other rules like this. One tenant stayed in the property for three months before I started the eviction. This took another two months to complete. When it was all done, the tenant was in the property for almost six months without paying rent. Make sure you run your business like a business. Taking action for phase 3.2. Take time to write down the business processes and procedures you should have in your business. Even if you do not have any properties now, answer these questions and put them in writing so you have them to refer to when you come across these things in your business. 1. What are the due, late, and eviction dates for your properties? 2. What are the late fees you are going to charge? 3. What will you do with partial payments? 4. What will you do when a tenant tells you they will get paid in two Fridays and they need you to wait until then to get paid? 5. How will you handle the eviction process? Will you or a property manager go through with the process? 6. Will you overpay for a property or fight to get the purchase price as low as possible? 7. If there is a major repair, will you only get one, two, or three or more major quotes to get the lowest price? 8. What dollar amount will be fine for your property manager to spend without your approval? 9. Will you allow tenants to work on the property and deduct it from the rent? 10. Will you inspect the property any time during the lease? 11. Will you increase the rents upon the lease renewal? 12. How will you handle complaints from the local government? There are many other questions that you will have to come up with and answer yourself. Always err on the side of running your business as a business. Remember, this business is how you will feed your family and pay your bills. Don't be a pushover and let your tenants get away with things you would never be able to get away with. Phase 3.3, understanding the process of turning a real estate transaction into cash flow. Are you sure this is the right thing to do? My wife asked me one day. Absolutely, babe. This is the right thing to do, I replied. Well, how do you actually make money in this? I mean, I understand that you rent out the property to tenants, but you haven't even bought the property yet, she said. The process is simple, I said to her. The process is a few steps, but they are easily handled. I have a realtor, title company, property manager, contractors, etc., all ready to help me through the process of turning this property into a money-making business. I understand that you know the process, but you are spending all of our savings on this property that could potentially be a money pit. If you want me to be on board, you need to explain the entire process, she said. This was the scene in my kitchen as I was buying my first property. Even though I had done all the research needed to get started, I still needed to convince my wife and teach her the entire business from scratch. She wanted to ease her fears of losing everything with knowledge of the business. As I walked her through the entire business, things really came to light that I didn't really know everything about the process. Holes were found, items missed, and working with my wife, we did our best to fix all the issues we had in the process. I would say that this is the way it is for half of the coaching students I have as I teach them real estate investing. More often than not, one spouse is fully bought in while the other spouse is much more unsure and even resistant. What it comes down to for those who are unsure and resistant is a lack of knowledge. As my wife and I worked together through the process, I was able to educate her on the real estate process to cash flow. She eventually, after lots of explaining, approved of the business and we bought our first property. Now, 35 properties and growing, she has no worries about the business and doesn't even think about it. Recently, I purchased three single family homes and a duplex from another investor. This was a great deal. $25,000 cash with the rest in a seller finance note. With the note payment and all the other expenses, I made $1,600 a month in rent. 
Once the note payment is paid off, I'll be making $2,300 a month from this purchase. The great thing was, I didn't even tell my wife I was doing it. I came home one day from finishing the transaction with the seller to be with my family. My wife asked me how my day was and I said to her, great, I just bought three single family homes and a duplex. We will make $1,600 a month in rent. Wow, that's great, honey, good job. Well, dinner is ready, she said, and that was it. I no longer needed to help her understand the business or even let her know what was going on. Since we are making tens of thousands of dollars each month and a great track record of 10 years of business success, she does not even think about the business. Now, let me walk you through the process of real estate transaction to cash flow. Understanding the process of turning a real estate transaction into cash flow. Now we are going to look at how you buy a rental property from beginning to end, step by step. The process is not complicated, but there are many steps to understand and follow. It is important to follow each step and learn the process included in each one of these steps in order to not lose money on a deal. We will start from the very beginning of the process to the end where you are making money every single month with passive income from the rent received. In this process, if a step is skipped, it may or may not be fine for you and your business. If you skip the title company step, you may end up with a home with a lien or back taxes on the property that you would have to pay for. Here is a diagram for the process from beginning to end. See diagram 3.3a. Now let's look at each one of these individually and dig deeper into what these mean. Locate and identify the potential investment property. The first step is to find a property among the hundreds that are currently listed for sale in the area where you would like to start investing. There are a few ways to start looking, but the quickest is to go to www.sillow.com and search for the type of property that could fit the criteria you are looking for. I suggest looking for a three bedroom, two bath, single family home with over 1400 square feet and a two car garage. The price range should be between $80,000 to $120,000. These types of properties will rent well and bring in a good cash flow each month with the current interest rate that you can get with a single family home. Evaluate the property. Now, single family homes are valued based upon comparable sales in the area of like properties. So to find the value of a property you are looking at, you want to find another home within a two mile radius of the subject property that has the same amount of bedrooms, bathrooms, and square footage. By doing this, you see what somebody else paid for the property and see if the asking price on your deal is a reasonable price or not. Zillow does a decent job at finding these comparable sales for you. It compares like homes to yours and gives you the opinion of what the value should be. I have found that Zillow values are on the high end, meaning they value the property a little higher than most appraisers would. Remember, one of the reasons why we buy real estate is that we can buy a property below market value and instantly gain equity in the property. This is because we make money when we buy the property and we realize money when we sell it. Obviously, it's best to get as much equity as you can out of the property when you buy it. That all depends on if the seller is going to sell it for less than the market value. What you need to do is negotiate with the seller and try to get them to accept an offer price that is less than market value. I try to shoot for 80% of market value, so I instantly gain 20% equity in the property. The example below shows that if you buy a property with a market value of $120,000 for only $100,000, you will instantly make $20,000 in equity because you bought the property cheaper than it was worth. See chart 3.3b. There are also other things that come into factor, like the rehab costs, which also eat into your equity because the purchase price plus the rehab costs equal the total amount to get the property rented. Your equity capture is the market value of the property minus the purchase price minus the rehab costs. If you fix up the kitchen, flooring, bathrooms, paint the walls, and do other things that make the property worth more, you will increase the value of the property. The example below shows that if you buy a home for $100,000 and you put in $25,000 to fix it up, the new market value will go up. Depending on the market, the value can go up quite significantly. In this example, you see the new market value is $180,000 because similar homes that are up to date like this one are selling for the same amount. The comparable sales of these other properties raise the value of your home because of the rehab you did on the home. 
With rehabbing the property, you have forced the appreciation of equity to $55,000. This is on top of the monthly passive income you make each time the renter pays their rent. See chart 3.3C. Analyze the numbers and make sure the property cash flows. This sounds like a hard thing to do, but in reality, it is really only elementary school math at play here. The only caveat is, if you can account for all of the expenses and income properly and anticipate future expenses that may eat into your cash flow, what it comes down to is income minus expenses equals a positive or negative cash flow. If the property rents for $1,000 per month and your expenses are $1,200 per month, you will lose $200 each month just by owning the property because of the negative cash flow. Now, if your property rents for $1,000 a month and your expenses are only $750 per month, you make $250 per month positive cash flow. There are many expenses that you will come across. Here's a list of a few you will encounter. Accounting, advertising, reserve funds, security services, electricity, insurance, management fees, lawn care, pest control, repairs, poverty taxes, utilities. It is important to make sure that you find all the expenses for the property itemized out so you can analyze the deal accurately and not buy a bad property. You can find my free investment property calculator on my website, which will do all the analysis of any deal for you. Link 3.3a. You also want to make sure you understand what it's going to cost to fix up the property in order to get it rented. You may want to bring in a few different contractors and get multiple bids for the repairs. It is wise to know what it's going to cost to fix up the property before you buy it. Trained professionals like contractors know what to look for that a new investor would not know about. Contact the owner and negotiate an agreement with them. This can be one of the more scary parts of the transaction process. It's always hard to approach someone you don't know and ask them if they would be willing to sell you their property for less than market value. But the more you do it, the easier it will get. This is the part where your personality must come out and show them that you are a credible and honest person that is willing to help them in any way possible. If they are willing to sell, you need to agree on a few things and have them put it into a contract. These include purchase price, inspection period, escrow length, concessions, and or contingencies and other items that you discuss and agree to. The owner may be willing to carry a note on the property and basically be the banker and you pay them the mortgage each month. There are many other questions and items in the contract you need to discuss. Create the contract on the agreed upon terms and the contract with the seller. Once you negotiated with the seller all the terms of the contract, you then need to write it up and have them sign it as soon as possible. By doing this, you are locking up the property so no one else can buy it from underneath you. There are many different types of templates for contracts for buying and selling a property. I used a template I got off the internet for the first property that I bought. It worked out just fine, and those contracts are easy to find. Check our resources page for sample contracts for you to use. Link 3.3b. Open escrow with a title company. Now it's time to get a third party involved in the deal. A third party is somebody that's impartial to the deal and has experience in the escrow process. There are many title companies that do this, and it's up to you and the seller to find one that you both can agree upon. Escrow basically is where the title company receives your contract that is signed by both parties and holds both parties to said contract. The title company will then do a search for any liens or encumbrances against the property. They will make sure that the property does not have any obligations like an outstanding mortgage or overdue taxes. If the title company signs off on the property, they issue you title insurance to cover any issues they may have missed while doing the search. This insurance is there to protect you in case the title company does not do the job right. Satisfactory inspections. Now that escrow is open, it is time for you to start your inspections of the property to make sure that you're buying a sound property. Inspections that you will probably want to have done are home inspection, termite inspection, flood inspection, roof inspection. There are other inspections you can possibly do if you'd like, but these are the typical inspections you should do. There is an expense involved in doing these inspections, but in my opinion, it's well worth it to do them. I do not want to buy a property that I will have to put tens of thousands of dollars into because I didn't pull out the detail of the deal when I should have. 
satisfy all necessary contingencies. There may be contingencies that you and the seller agree to in the negotiation process. Some contingencies may include a financing contingency, insurance contingency, selling of a current home, appraisal, and basically anything that you and the seller agree to. You can ask for just about any type of contingency you want, but it's up to the seller if they want to agree to these contingencies. It doesn't hurt to ask for a contingency if it might be necessary to have. For example, if the property is in a flood or tornado zone, it might be good to have a contingency stating that the sale is contingent on you being able to get adequate insurance for the property. Work with the title company to close escrow. Once the title work has been done and no liens are against the property and all the inspections and contingencies are accounted for, it is now time to sign the escrow papers that the title company creates. Both the seller and the buyer sign the escrow papers, itemizing all of the closing costs as well as the terms of the deal. That title company will then receive your money that you are required to pay the seller and distribute the proceeds of the sale to the seller. The title company will also create a deed of sale and record it with a local county recorder, making the transaction public record for anyone to see. Once the deed has been recorded, the property is now yours and you are ready to start rehabbing the property. Make sure your contractors are ready to rehab the property the very day you get the property. Don't waste any time because time is money. Make ready, rehab the property. Now that you have the keys to the property, it is time for you to get in there and rehab it. If you're doing the work yourself, you will save a lot of money, but there is a lot more work on your shoulders to get done. Doing the work yourself will also take longer than if you get a good contractor who will work on your property quickly and efficiently. A good contractor will work hard for you to get the property on the market and ready to rent as soon as possible. Be sure to account for the rehab costs when you are buying the property so you don't run out of money before you have the ability to rent it. Find a renter. It is now time to put the property on the market for rent. There are many different ways to find renters. Depending on your market, there are different ways for finding tenants. In some markets, Craigslist.com is the perfect way to find renters. In other markets, it is better to hire a realtor who matches a tenant to a property because that is the way the tenants find places to rent. Be sure to look at the market and take into account the proper amount of marketing budget you need for the property. I always have my property managers find the tenants, show the property to them, sift through all the applications, and present the best options to me. I then have the final say, and I run a background check and criminal check on all tenants that I choose to have live in my property. In the past, I was cheap and tried to save $30 per tenant by not running the background, criminal, and eviction check. I eventually realized that by running these checks on prospective tenants, I'm able to weed out tenants that would possibly move out of my property quickly. It is expensive to evict a tenant. Here are some costs you may incur. Eviction fees, attorney fees, writ fees, and cleaning up the property. Don't forget the loss of rents for that time that the property is not rented. I found that by spending $30 on a background check, it saves me from many evictions that cost upwards of $1,000 to $1,500 in costs. I was so glad that I did a background criminal and eviction check on one lady who had been evicted four times in the last three years. That's $30 that possibly saved me $1,500 in carrying costs, loss of rents, eviction fees, etc. I strongly encourage you to always run a background criminal and eviction check on all possible tenants. Go to www.masterpassiveincome.com slash resources to find good places to do background checks. Sign the lease agreement with the tenant. This is another item that I let my property manager take care of. He meets with the tenant, has them sign the lease, and pay the first month's rent and the security deposit. Once he has all this done, he gives the tenant the keys on the designated date of the move-in. If they move in in the middle of the month, you prorate the rent for each day they lived there to the next month. So if they move in on June 15th, there are 15 more days in the month for them to pay rent for. If they are paying $700 a month for the rent, you divide the monthly rent, $700, by the days in the month, 30 days. 
which gives you $23.33 per day. The daily rate times the amount of days the tenant will live there equals that month's rent. So 15 days times $23.33 equals $350 to move in with 15 days left in the month. Many times you will get tenants that are leaving their previous place they were living in on the 31st and move into yours on the first of the month. Make a positive return on your money. If you followed these steps and bought the property right, you will be making a monthly return on your investment. This is from the passive income from the rent received minus the expenses for the property. Remember that the monthly rents are only one part of six different ways that you can make money, and it is the most important. Taking action for phase 3.3. Go to masterpassiveincome.com resources and download the free sample contract to review. Read it over and be ready to fill it out on your first offer to purchase a house. Continue looking for properties on Zillow.com. Keep a record of the properties that interest you in the Excel spreadsheet you already created. Phase 4. Finish Work Phase 4.1 build your real estate business dream team. Teamwork is the ability to work together toward a common vision, the ability to direct individual accomplishments towards organizational objectives. It is the fuel that allows common people to attain uncommon results. Andrew Carnegie. The hallway was dark, wet, cold, and had a smell that was both old and familiar. Doors lined this cramped hallway leading to unknown rooms that held items we were both curious and excited to see. If these rooms could tell you their secrets of things past, one can only imagine what they would say. The rain almost never stopped here. Day after day, the rain relentlessly pounded on the land. For this particular hallway, both the east and west entrance was exposed to the open air and the afternoon sky. The wind and rain funneled through this hallway, making us even more cold than we were outside under the cloudy skies. Soaking wet from the rain and shivering from the wind, we slowly walked into the hallway. As I led my wife and our four children down from room to room, we stopped at each door to look inside, to see what each room held. Even though each room was the same size and shape, they all had different items from the past in them. Swords, armor, cannons, replica clothing, and kids' toys. What stood out to us the most was the last room. This was not really a room, but a cave carved into the mountain of rock that the entire castle was built on. The last room in this hallway was not like any of the others. This cave was where the enemies of kings would be held, tortured, and eventually killed. Chains and shackles were attached to the walls to hang the prisoners. Instruments of torture lined the walls, and an uneasy feeling crept over all of us in the room. Seeing a place like this that was built thousands of years ago was just awe-inspiring. Castle Edinburgh was just one of the many castles we toured as we made our way through Scotland on over to Ireland. Growing up in a lower middle-class family, our annual vacation was going camping in the summer. We never went anywhere we couldn't drive, which wasn't bad at all. I didn't know any different and didn't care. Even though we didn't have much money, I had a great childhood. Never before did I think I would be able to travel to Europe for vacation, let alone take a six-week trip through 11 countries. In March of 2018, I took my wife and four kids through England, Scotland, Ireland, Israel, Austria, Switzerland, Germany, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Netherlands. It was an amazing time that we will remember for the rest of our lives. All throughout the six-week trip, I did not have to work a single hour or even think about my real estate business. Even though my business was making me money, my business ran without me. In fact, the less I work, the more money I make. Many people ask me how I'm able to go on six-week trips at a time. They are most interested in how I do not worry about my business or paying my bills. The answer is simple. I have an automatic business that runs itself. Don't be a solopreneur. Recently, there have been a lot of people talking about the term solopreneur. This is basically where someone quits their J-O-B and starts a business for themselves. The idea of going at it alone without a job holding you back is appealing, but has a huge flaw. Remember the cash flow quadrant? 
The most important thing you can learn is to move from the employee and sole proprietor, E and S side, to the investor and business owner, I and B side, as quickly as possible. When you go it alone and become a solopreneur, you are really just that, alone. This is not the way you move to the I and B side of the cash flow quadrant. All you have basically done to become a solopreneur is move from the E to the S quadrant. The S is for sole proprietor. Instead of having a J-O-B as an employee, you now own a J-O-B. Instead of having one boss at your job, you now have many bosses who are your customers. Just like if you do not work at your job, you don't get paid. If you don't service your customer, you don't get paid. The reason why I'm able to have an automatic business is because I jumped to the I and B side of the quadrant with owning just one rental property. As I build my business, the business gets larger and I make more money. All the while, I don't work but pay others to do the work for me. The day you buy a rental property, you become an investor. The next step is to also be a business owner by automating the business. Hiring property managers, realtors, contractors, bankers, inspectors, etc. to do the work for you while you are free to do whatever you want with your life. Building an automatic business. Now is the time where you are going to start building your business. You need to put in the legwork to build your team that is going to help you to be successful in real estate. In this section, you will learn how to build a real estate dream team who will run your business for you. Like all other team sports, you are only as good as the team around you. Real estate investing takes a team of people to do it well. I think of myself as a coach that has multiple players on my team. I am the one keeping them focused on the vision that I have given them. Also, I give them the resources and responsibility to do what they are best at and get out of their way. Being a coach, I am not the one doing the work. My team is. They are the ones who find properties, inspect them, rehab them, get them rented, manage them, and make sure the goals are being reached. The diagram below shows what it is truly like to be an entrepreneur. You are the center of everything in your business. It rises and falls on your shoulders. If you try to do everything yourself, you will have a business that only works when you do. You want to be the business owner that employs or contracts with each of the other people to make your business run successfully without you. See chart 4.1a. There are many different types of team members you need when you first start out investing in real estate. I suggest getting to work networking and finding the right team members for your team. If the team member doesn't fit into your team, move on and find someone else. Must have team members. Property Managers, PM. If you decide to manage your properties yourself, you don't need to have a PM because you manage the property. I personally do not like to manage my own properties, so I hire a PM. If you do decide to have a PM, you must take your time and find one that you feel comfortable with and can trust. Realtors. Realtors can be your best way to find good investment properties that bring in passive income in monthly cash flow. You should find realtors that understand how investment properties work and not just how to sell an owner-occupied property. When I go into a new city to find investment properties, I usually meet with at least five different realtors and basically interview them to see if they know how to find and make offers on investment properties. If the realtor is explaining to me about how nice the window coverings are and not about how much money it would take to get the property rented, I usually move on to the next realtor. Contractors. When you find a property you want to buy and hold as a rental, there usually is rehab that needs to go into the property. Everything from painting and flooring to re-roofing and foundation work can be assessed by the contractor to get a quote for the repairs. This quote is important because your offer to purchase the house depends on how much money you need to put into the property to get it rented. If you need to put $5,000 into the property before you can rent it, your offer price should reflect that expense. Make your offer $5,000 lower than you would if it was 100% ready to be rented. It is very important to know that you make your profit when you buy the house. You realize the profit when you sell it. Mortgage Brokers It is good to have two or three mortgage brokers on your team. Since funding is the lifeblood of the business, without funding or leverage, you would not be able to buy a home and rent it out unless you get your owner financing. Pay all cash or get investors to put all the money into the deal. For most investment properties, 
10% to 20% would be adequate for the purchase of your rental home. If you buy a home for $80,000, your down payment would be anywhere from $8,000 to $16,000. If you shop around, you may be able to find a good broker who can get you into a home for only 10% as well as get around the private mortgage insurance because of the way they structure the mortgage. Insurance Agents Insurance agents are the members who will be protecting you in case there are any issues or problems that may arise on your property. Everything from fires, theft, liability, and any other possible issue with your property, your insurance agent is the one who's going to help you get through all of it. You need to make sure that you have a good agent who knows about rental properties and not just owner-occupied single-family homes. Remember, this is a business you have, and you need to make sure that you are covered well enough. It is also good to have a general umbrella policy, which is an overall liability policy that's going to protect you above and beyond your normal homeowner's insurance in case there are any liability suits against you. Investing Coach A real estate investing coach will save you tens of thousands of dollars in losses and are well worth every penny. Now, there are some bad ones out there. You know the type. Their business is teaching about real estate, not real estate itself. They may own a few properties, but do not have a successful real estate business. If I had found a coach when I first started, I would have saved tens of thousands of dollars in lost rents, eviction costs, overpaying on properties, missed inspections, excess expenses, and much more. It makes me sad when I think about how much money I've lost, literally tens of thousands of dollars. Oh well, at least I'm here now and have learned all the wrong ways to do business and now have a successful real estate business. When you are looking for a coach, keep these things in mind. Do you feel like you can trust the coach? Does the coach seem like a person you would get along well with? Does the coach practice what he preaches? Does the coach have a track record of helping others build successful businesses? Nice to have team members. Wholesalers. Wholesalers and other investors are in the real estate business, but may not necessarily want to buy and hold the properties they put under contract. Wholesalers find properties that are usually not on the market and enter into a contract agreement with the homeowner to purchase their home. These wholesalers can assign the contract to you for a finder's fee, and then they are out of the deal. The fee you pay the wholesaler depends on the deal and the particular wholesaler. The wholesalers usually understand how buy and hold investments work, so they will bring you deals that are usually cash flow positive and bring you the passive income you need. Real Estate Investor Groups These are groups of investors just like you who can help you with your business. REIG are good to help you find new deals, find new creative ways to structure deals, find other investors, and network with others and further build your team. Link 4.1a nationalreia.com. Mentors. Finding a mentor can be one of your best resources to get you started and continue to grow your real estate business. They are hard to find though. A mentor is one that knows what they are doing as well as has the time and desire to help you learn. Find a mentor that is currently where you want to be and is willing to give you an hour or two of their time monthly. It is always helpful to have someone that you can reach out to when you get stuck on a deal and you need a little helpful advice on how to get past a roadblock that is stopping you. Mentors have the experience, the knowledge, contacts, and willingness to help you in your investing career. It is crucial that you don't just focus on yourself when you are looking for a mentor. Having a mentor is a two-way street and the mentor must be able to get something from you in return. It would not be wise to go to a potential mentor and ask him or her to give time, effort, knowledge, and wisdom into you without offering something in return. Be sure to think of how you can benefit the mentor as you are looking to get him up on your team. You are selling yourself to them as a worthwhile investment in their time and experiences. Investors. Like mortgage brokers, investors are part of your team and will help you acquire the deal with as little money out of your pocket as possible. For example, you can structure a deal on a 24-unit apartment building you find with a lead investor and passive investors. The lead investor is the one who manages the business and does all the work. Passive investors are there to help contribute their personal funds to the down payment or cash purchase of the deal. Being the lead investor, you would keep a percentage of the equity for doing all the work. This includes items like finding the deal, 
structuring the deal, starting and running the business, finding the investors, managing the property managers, distributing the monthly and quarterly funds to the passive investors, dealing with accountants and taxes, and managing the managers of the property. Basically, the lead investor does all the work and the passive investors get a monthly or quarterly check in the mail. Title company. Your title company is the one that's going to make sure that your property that you are buying does not have any problems. The problems could be liens against the property, back taxes, improper recording of deeds, or a host of other problems that could potentially rise. They will give you title insurance that protects you from anything they may have missed in the search for any issues with the title. The reason why they are not a must-have is because they really are a dime a dozen. If you find a nationwide title company, most likely you will be taken care of well. Appraiser. The appraiser is the one that is going to set a value on your property when you need it. You cannot always use your own appraiser, but it is always good to have someone on your team that can give you some advice on the value of your property. Lawyers. It is said that in real estate, it's not if you get sued, it's only a matter of when. It is wise to have a lawyer on your team, not necessarily one that you pay and have on as a retainer, but someone that you are able to call when something goes wrong. Be sure it is the type of lawyer that handles real estate and or rental property issues. Banker. Your banker is someone that will help you get loans that you would probably not normally get. Bankers don't just look at your credit score and financial history. They also look at you and see if you are the type of person they want to do business with and someone who can pay off the loan. If you work with a banker and you are not presentable in a professional way, the banker may not feel that you are able to pay off the loan. Even though the property will bring in enough money to pay for the mortgage, the banker may think that you would not pay the mortgage. Be sure to get a banker on your team. Accountant. My accountant is almost worth his weight in gold. I hate doing accounting and my taxes. I would actually pay double what he charges in order to have it done fast and well by a professional. Find a good accountant that knows the tax law well and will help you save as much money from taxes as possible. My accountant actually worked for the IRS and knows what they look for when considering an audit. This is a benefit because he does his best to make sure I never get audited. Build a team everywhere you invest. Whenever I go into a new area to invest, I always work on my team before I even start. Many times, I start a new area of the country without even in visiting the area. With how amazing technology is for investing, I do not even need to see the property physically before I buy it. My team looks at the property, sends me pictures, fixes up the property, all without any of my physical help or time. In each area where I invest, I have a different team. Some, like mortgage brokers, can be used all over the state or country and be on multiple teams at the same time. Others, like realtors and property managers, can only be local because you need the people on the ground in each market where you invest. They are your eyes and ears for your business, and they keep the business running with you out of the picture. Find the best players to be on your team. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Get the players that will last the long haul and help your team win at the end of the race. What to look for in a property manager. Your real estate business depends on who you have managing the property and how they manage it as well. If you manage the properties yourself, great, more power to you. I personally do not want to manage my own properties, so I hire a property manager, PM, to manage it for me. I would rather spend my time on the things that I want and pay my property manager to manage the property for me. I love receiving the rent checks from my property manager each month and not having to do a thing to get it. All my work was done in the beginning when I bought the property and set up my business. Now it is on autopilot. Here's a good start to finding the right property manager for your real estate business. Since I invest all over the country, I depend on my property managers doing the job right and the way I expect them to. When I am looking for a new property manager, I always meet with four to five property managers in person while they show me the area I am going to start investing. I like to meet with at least four different property managers, so I hopefully find one and a backup that will take care of my business well. The items in the list below are non-negotiable for me when I look for a property manager. There are other things I look for in a property manager, but I will not do without these. The only way to find out if your property manager has these qualities is to build a relationship with him and ask many questions. 
The six deal breakers for property managers. Trustworthiness. You must be able to trust your property manager. Remember, they are your employee and they are working for you. One property manager I had was not trustworthy and I had to fire her. There were missing receipts, unexplained expenses, upset tenants, etc. Don't put up with a bad property manager. Get rid of them quickly. Like any employee you have, hire slow, fire fast. I treat my property managers like every employee I have ever had. If they're good, I treat and pay them well. They are running my business for me. And if it was not for them, I would not have a business. But if they are bad, I get rid of them as fast as possible. Accountability. Everything the property manager does should be run through you and you should be able to verify what they do. I give my property managers the authority to spend under $100 per property per month without my approval. I don't want to be bothered with a $5 toilet leak, but I do want to be bothered about a $500 water heater or a $2,000 furnace replacement. I review every statement and every expense and income that I receive. If there are any issues or questions, I ask them right away. If the property manager is unable to adequately answer my questions, I start to get suspicious of them doing their job well and how much I can trust them. Once the seed of doubt is planted, it takes a lot of time for the property manager to build that trust back up in me so I am able to fully trust them. Communication. The property manager should be able to return your call, text, or email within the same day or at least within 24 hours. This is a non-negotiable. Only with good communication can your real estate business run well and keep you and your tenants happy. I have had bad property managers and they make your life too hard to keep them. I find that the main problem with the lack of communication is that I start to worry about my properties and imagine the worst possible scenarios for my properties. I employ my property managers so that I don't have to think about the properties. If he or she is not communicating promptly, I get concerned because I am worried about my business and that is what I pay my property managers to do. Worry about my business so I don't have to. While I am screening out property managers before I invest in a new area, I expect the PM to be on their A game and be in constant conversation with me because he wants to get my business. If the PM has horrible communication while he was trying to get my business, I can only imagine how much worse it would be when I actually hire him to do the job. I have passed on many PMs because of their lack of communication in the hiring period because it will more than likely get worse, not better. Quality of work. When you have a good PM, the quality of the rehab or repairs she will do should meet your standards. You should be able to rely on your PM to make the property desirable to your tenants and get top dollar for the rent. If your properties are run down, the rent amount will be much lower than if you take care of the properties because they are not as desirable. Your PM is who makes sure the property is desirable. If you are not able to get the same market rents as the properties near you, look into the quality of product your PM is selling to the prospective tenants. References. Just like hiring any other employee, check for references and see if they have a good track record with previous and current landlords they are working for. If they have good references, you have hopefully been able to get a leg up on finding a good PM. I never understood when PMs do not give references. I had one potential PM tell me that he will not give any references because his other landlords are confidential. This was a huge red flag for me. No matter the reason for him being secretive, this goes against points two and three. It shows that they do not want to be held accountable and they may not be trustworthy enough for me to hire them. I moved on. Commission percentage. The amount that I pay my PM is based on what I contract with them for their services. Some areas, 8% of rents is the going rate, and in others, 10% is. If it is hard to find a good PM in a specific area, you may pay an awesome PM 12% because you are getting awesome service for your money. I have an area where I'm paying 12% for my property manager, but he is worth every penny. The biggest thing I can leave you with is this. When you get a good PM, pay them and treat them well. The PM whom I pay 12% of the rents, which is rather high for a percentage, is worth every penny. One day, I thought to change the terms of our agreement and bring down the percentage to 10%. After I considered the change, the amount of money I would save would not compare to the amount of dissatisfaction my PM would feel. The decrease would lower his desire to do the job right. 
Just imagine if your boss came to you and asked you to take a pay decrease all while you are the one making the money for him. That wouldn't be good at all. Again, when you find a good property manager, pay them what they deserve. Questions to ask property managers. Property managers are absolutely vital in this line of business. If you do not have a good property manager, your business will go down the drain and you will lose money and possibly lose your properties. I have experience in property managers that have lied, stole money, put false expenses on all my properties. All of this could have been avoided by finding a good property manager. Below is a list of questions that I ask prospective property managers when I'm going to start investing in a new area. What you want to find is a property manager that you can trust and can give the responsibility of running your business. This initial phone conversation is just the start of a long relationship with your property manager. Your goal here is to get information as well as start developing a rapport with the property manager. You want to find someone that you can get along with and enjoy working with them. I learned a long time ago that I do not want to work with anyone whom I do not like to be around. Life is too short to waste it on people that make your life harder and take tons of energy to deal with. Here are some questions I ask potential property managers. How long have you been a property manager? This question is more of a general question for your information. I have had bad property managers that have had many years of experience. I've also had good property managers that had no experience. I would suggest finding a property manager that has experience managing properties if you are new to rental properties. Remember that property managers are your employee and they need to follow your business rules. If they do not follow your instructions and it seems like they are possibly lying to you, it may be time to get rid of them. Like hiring any employee, you want to hire slow and fire fast. Make sure you hire the right person the first time because it takes a lot of work to fire them. After you fire a PM, you need to spend the time to find somebody new, train him, and start your business building again. How many properties are you managing right now? This too is another question that is more for your information and is not necessarily a deal breaker. Obviously, the more properties the property manager is managing tends to normally be a good sign, but not necessarily. It is just a number that they are telling you and would be hard to verify. I just like to have a conversation with them to see if I hit it off with them and I feel comfortable working with them. How many vacancies do you have right now? The percentage of vacancy units for a property owner should be as low as possible. To find the vacancy rate, you divide the number of vacant months by the total months of the year. If a tenant stays in the property for one year, that would be a 0% vacancy factor. If a single family home is vacant for one month, then the vacancy rate would be 8%. One month divided by 12 months equals 8%. The vacancy rate now is a good indication of the market and the property manager as well. The market might be a rough area to rent properties, meaning that the tenants move in and out quickly and there is a high turnover. I have rented in some areas that I would probably have one eviction per year if I'm not really on top of everything. Places like this, it seems like the tenants change homes like they change their shirts. I personally don't see how they can do that. I hate moving. The vacancy rate also shows how well the property manager keeps his properties rented. If he does not do a good job with maintaining the properties, keeping the tenants content, and knowing what amount of rent to charge for a particular home, vacancies will get high. Remember that you are in the service business when you're renting properties. If the service you're providing, which is a home for a renter, is not up to market standards, you are going to lose tenants quickly and lose money. How long does it take, on average, to fill a vacancy? This is a great question because the longer property is not rented, the more money you lose. If your property rents for $700 a month and the property is vacant for one and a half months, that's $1,050 out of your pocket in lost revenue because the property is vacant. Did you create your own lease and the property manager contracts? If no, where did you get them? Please send them to me so I can review them. I like to look at the lease my property managers are going to use because it shows me what type of manager they are and what they expect from other tenants. If the lease is very lenient, the property manager may be lenient on the tenant and possibly allow problems to arise that may cost you money in the long run. If the contract is very strict and rigid, you protect yourself from many unforeseen issues and are covered when something goes wrong. 
You want a property manager that will take care of your property and keep the tenants accountable to do the same. Just know that a strict property manager may be pretty meticulous and on top of things, which will help make you and save you money. What is your late rent policy? Some property managers charge $40, $50, and $75 for a late charge from the tenants, depending on the area and the tenants. I usually leave this up to the property manager to decide. I have had some property managers that do keep the late fees for themselves, and I've also had others that split the late fee with me 50-50. The property manager needs to keep at least 50% of the money because they are the ones doing the work with collecting on late rents, which can be a headache. What percentage of tenants do you have to evict? Some areas may have a very low eviction rate, and others may be a very high eviction rate. I have found that the lower class markets tend to have more evictions than the middle to upper class markets. For whatever reason it is, I've just seen that to be true. In the places where you have high eviction rates, the key is to do a thorough background check on the prospective tenant. Make sure you do a criminal, credit, and eviction check on the tenant before they move in. Would you please explain to me the eviction process in your area? Each city, county, and state all have different laws for the eviction process, and it is wise to learn the process as you are getting started with buying rental properties. Your property manager should know the eviction process and also what to do and not do while he is evicting the tenant. You don't want to break any laws, but you do want to get the bad tenants out quickly so you can get good ones in. What are your management fees? Management fees vary from area to area and even manager to manager. An average fee would be 8% to 10% of the total rents collected each month. You may get some higher, some lower, but remember, you get what you pay for. I have one area where I pay 12% to my property manager, but he is worth every single penny. What do you charge for finding new tenants? This is basically a finder's fee for finding new tenants for your property. The manager has to do marketing, showing the property, taking applications, signing leases, preceding the first month rent and security deposit, and giving the tenants the keys to move in. This is a lot of work, and your property manager should be paid for it. Some charge the entire first month's rent as a finder's fee, but I personally find that to be ridiculous. If your PM does charge a high finder's fee, make sure it is in writing that you will only pay that fee one time each year from the date it is rented. This is to protect you so that you don't have to pay again if you have to find a new tenant in the same year. The property manager's job is to find a good tenant, one that will stay there for many years and not just turn over in six months. One area that I'm in, I pay my property manager $100 finder's fee every time the property is rented, even if it is in the same year which I have had in the past. If a property is vacant, do you charge for monitoring and maintaining vacant units? This type of fee is a huge red flag for me. If the property is not rented, I'm not making money. And in turn, the property manager should not be making money because he is responsible for getting the property rented and for keeping it rented. If I'm not getting paid, then my property manager is not getting paid. Doesn't it seem like a conflict of interest if the property manager charges $50 if the property is not rented, but also makes $60 if the property is rented? There's only a $10 incentive for him to get the property rented, which is not very much. I stay away from property managers who charge this, but even if they do, I've negotiated some out of this charge because I will not pay it and they remove it. Do you also market properties as a broker? This is an interesting question because like I said, in some areas, the marketing can be through Craigslist or may even be through the MLS and need a broker to rent them out. Either way, it doesn't really matter in my opinion. I just like to know. If I decide to sell my property, do I have to list it with you? Some property managers may require this in a contract that they sign with you. I would completely strike it out and remove that from the contract or find a new property manager. Just like with realtors who want to sign an exclusive agreement with you, never sign anything exclusive with anyone. Can I see some of the other properties you manage? If you're in the area and can see the properties, it's always a good idea to look at how the property manager does his business. I also like to talk to the tenants to ask them questions like, how do you like the property? How long have you lived here? How long does it take for the property manager to return your phone calls? How long does it take for him to respond to repairs needed? Do you recommend special incentives for tenants? In some cases, it may be good to offer incentives to prospective tenants 
or even current tenants. I invest in one area that snows heavily and gets very cold. So if I have a vacant property in November, I drop the rent amount, 75 to to $100, to get it rented before it starts to freeze. I have some tenants that have lived in my properties for over three to four years, and I like to give them a little something to show them my appreciation for being such great tenants. They can be a small gift card to Home Depot or Lowe's or even Starbucks. I also like to have a thank you card for them expressing my gratitude. A little gratitude goes a long way. If I want additional marketing for specific vacant units, how would we arrange that? If there is a property that has been vacant too long or one that I don't want to stay vacant long at all, I may want the property manager to go above and beyond his normal marketing for this property. How do you screen tenants? There are many ways to screen prospects for your properties and your property manager should do all of them for you. This includes things like checking employment history, checking rental history, checking references, and even running a background credit, criminal, and eviction checks. It is also helpful if your property manager is able to accurately judge the character of potential renters quickly. Some people have a gift of discernment. That helps in this process, and some do not. It's just wise to listen to your property manager to see if they like the tenant or not, and if they desire to rent to them. Do you give each applicant a credit, criminal, and eviction check? Doing a credit criminal and eviction check is an absolute must for me and my properties. I have been burned so many times because of not doing these checks and have fully implemented them into my business. A $30 background check will save me at least $1,000 a year in eviction fees and lost rents. If the property manager will not do it, make sure that you will have the ability to do one yourself. How do you collect rent and when is the rent due? In some areas, a personal check is just fine. In other areas, cash or cashier's check is the only way to do business. Depending on the area, you need to do what you can to make sure that you get your rent on time, every time, without any issues. The rent is always due on the first of the month and is late on the second. On the second, if they do not pay the rent, you give them a three-day notice letting them know that the eviction will start on the fifth of the month. Once you start the eviction process, don't stop until you get every penny back from the eviction process. I make the tenant pay all the fees I incur, late fees, and the rent due. How do your tenants contact you? This is more for your information, and it probably varies by property manager and even tenant. It's always good to have a property manager that can have multiple ways of contact, email, text, phone, and even mail. What is your maximum response time? For tenants, I think an adequate maximum response time from the property manager is 24 hours. Anything longer than 24 hours, you are going to start losing money. Your tenants are your customers, which means they are the property manager's customers. You must make sure they are well taken care of. If I'm unable to reach you, what is your maximum response time to get back to me? For me, the maximum response time should be 12 hours after I contact my property manager. If my property manager does not respond to me within 12 hours, I start to get concerned about my properties and my property manager. There should be no reason for a property manager to take more than 12 or possibly even 24 hours to get back to you. Anything longer than that is just unacceptable. Communication is huge in this business. I live as far as 1,500 miles away from a place where I invest, so I rely on communication. Taking action for phase 4.1. Start building your real estate dream team by searching the internet for the must-have team members. Make a list of at least three different possible team members for each type of must-have member. Get on the phone and call as many property managers as you can find. You are basically interviewing the PMs because you are hiring them to run your business. Try to select three to five managers that you think may be a good team member. Eventually, you will select one or possibly two PMs that will work on your 